Good evening and welcome to another edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I am your business diva, Melanie Collette. Welcome back. Ah, I'm so sorry that I've been gone for so long. Peter Armstrong and Danielle and Bruce and Rob and Dee Dee. Hi, welcome, welcome Giovanni, welcome. Um, my guest today is the one and only Kevin Cullis. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name right. I usually get, usually go over that during the uh, pre-show and I didn't. So if I got that wrong, please do correct me, Kevin, when I, <laughs> all right, cool. Kevin Cullis um, is my guest today. I see Ron Edwards, and Ron Edwards is in the chat. Poor Ron. Ron. Ron has the patience of a saint. I'm just telling you, like his, his services go, go far beyond uh, that of uh, Ron Edwards' notebook. I, I just, I adore you and I, and I thank you, Ron. I know I've been a major pain in your side all day. <laughs> but know that I adore you and I appreciate you. Um, Giovanni and Robin and Vanessa, welcome to the chat. Brand new Ron Edwards' notebook today. Very exciting. Very excited about that. Uh, and again, I'm, listen, I'm sorry I've been away. I was away all week. I, not, not only was I, I super busy, but I'm, I'm going to be, it, look, in the interest of, of complete transparency here, ever since I lost my, my, my fur diva, th this time of day right before the show has kind of been the most um, difficult time of the day because this, this is the time of the day. Um, right before, she's usually right next to me and uh, you know and I get home home a couple hours before the show and we usually kind of hang out a little bit before I go into the studio area and 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 do the show and it's just been really um it's been it's been more difficult <laughs> than I than I anticipated so it's been tricky so I apologize trying to get back on track it's been tough um welcome vanessa and james and kevin collis who is my guest today by the way ladies and gentlemen he is the author of the book how would jesus do business such an important question too uh particularly because i find um that people in general some people seem to think that you can separate these things that you can separate um your politics from your Christianity and your business from your Christianity. I, I, I tend to, to beg to, to differ. And so uh, I'm very interested in what Kevin has to say in this regard. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Keith Little, who is in the chat for, um, for connecting uh, Kevin, Kevin and, uh, and myself. I never know. Absolutely. If I... Thank you, Keith. Yes, Keith, you totally You're rock. Awesome. Yes, indeed. As you guys can hear, Kevin is waiting in the wings. So, before we uh, do that, a little bit of housekeeping. If you're not following me on Twitter, you may do so at Money Talk Mel. That's how you follow me on Twitter. You can follow the Facebook page at Money Talk with Melanie. Um, if you would like to follow my political musings, which will probably be really ratcheting up um, soon uh, at NJGOP Diva. And the reason why I say that is because it, for some of you, I mean, if you're watching the news, the midterms um, are, are coming up, right? Like you're watching the news and everybody's saying like the midterms are coming up, the midterms are coming up. For those of us who work on elections, the midterms are now. <laughs> the midterms are now. In fact, um, I, I started, you know, making phone calls and, and all that stuff for setting up my local uh, county call center today. And uh, actually go, going to be doing some equipment shopping in, in a little bit. So, you know, uh, mid midterm election uh, stuff is like going into full gear within the next week or two. For those, you know, for those of us who are doing that election thing. I just, yeah, we got to listen. If we don't keep Congress, ladies and gentlemen, it's a wrap. It is extremely important that we keep Congress, nothing the president does will matter if we don't keep Congress. I'm just saying, he, he'll be a lame duck and it won't matter. So we, ha we have to keep Congress. So the midterms are very important. And uh, 
all, all persons who are involved in uh, politics will be very stressed, including myself. So it should be fun. <laughs> and hopefully everybody, uh, all, all of the uh, politicians on our side of the aisle will be behaving themselves. Let's, uh, let's just hope that that's what's going to happen. I also want to send out some best wishes to uh, First Lady Melania Trump, the beautiful, classy, wonderful Melania Trump, who had to have some surgery today, and uh, from what I understand, is recovering nicely. But I want to give a shout out to her and uh, God love her. Talk about another person with the patience of a saint. <laughs> Married to Donald J. Trump. God bless her soul. Anyway, um, I'm sorry. Was that was that too much? I'm not, probably going to get in trouble. I mean, come on. <laughs> No, but I, I, I am wishing, um, I'm wishing our first lady a, a speedy recovery. That's, you know, that's for real. Uh, apparently she had some kind of, um, I, I don't want to say growth or something like that, but you know, that, that, that's, that's the pleasure of, be, of being a woman. We have very complex bodies. It's just, it's just such a fantastic thing. Um, <laughs> speaking of the Trumps, uh, President Trump said that uh, he's going to work with President Z uh, to get uh, back into, uh, get ZTE back into business. Well, uh, uh, I don't know. China's fourth largest uh, smartphone maker. He announced last week had stopped operations after the U.S. government banned sales to the firm for seven years. Ah, so I see some massive negotiating going on. Now, this is a report according to the New York Times. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Now, None of this will come as a surprise to anyone, I don't think, who's been paying attention to the uh, United States Postal Service. They saw their second quarter net loss, more than double from a year ago. Now their losses are up to $1.3 billion, despite a 5% increase in package volume. I'm trying to figure out how that works. I'm not, I'm not quite understanding how that works. Now, uh, they're saying, okay, this is according to the United States Post Office, uh, let's see, how, how are they putting it? It's partly due to increased employee costs, shocker, uh, including offering workers more hours to better compete with e-commerce giant Amazon. That makes a lot of sense. Um, President Trump, by the way, has ordered a task force to evaluate the operations and finances of the United States Post Office. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Let me tell you something. I, I the last time I was at the post office, I um, I went to, I, I went to buy something simple. I think it was a book of stamps or something like that, right? The receipt. Has anybody else experienced this? The receipt had to be a foot long for a book of stamps. And I don't know when the last time any of you have bought register tape, but it's not cheap. It's not inexpensive at all. And, there, and, and you know, some, some stores like Walmart will give you a choice, like whether or not you want your receipt, like yes or no, which I thought was very, think is very smart. You have no choice at the post office but to take this really long receipt. And I was like, you know, and I, and I think I said this to the woman, not that she has any control over it. I was like, you know, you guys probably would save a lot of money if we had the option to take this long receipt or not all over the country. Probably could save thousands of dollars just on that. And that's just like a little bit of government waste. It just seems really ridiculous. So I'm glad that President Trump is making that move and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, as long as he leaves my Amazon alone. Just saying. <laughs> I don't want to pay more for shipping for my Amazon. Selfishly. All right. <laughs> You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, and a brand new uh, Ron Edwards notebook is coming up in the break. And my guest, Kevin Cullis, is coming up. He is author of the book, How Would Jesus Do Business? Very excited. The subtitle is Bible Secrets for Christian Startup Entrepreneurs. Very excited to talk to him. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. President Trump showed real leadership, wisdom, and moxie by putting America out of the Obama executive order nuclear deal with Iran. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, for 39 years, Iran has been shouting death to America and Israel. Iran has for too long been given free reign by America. 
American president. While that Islamic nation took over a U.S. embassy, financially supported Hezbollah, and blew up a U.S. Marine base. More recently, Iran frantically worked to try and produce nuclear missiles, which they threatened to utilize to blow up targets in both the United States and Israel. So along came President Obama, who through executive order, enacted a nuclear arms deal without congressional approval, nor agreed to by Iran's neighbors. If that deal were allowed to run its course, Iran would be free and clear to produce nuclear weapons after a decade. One has to wonder, since inspectors were prevented from making sure that Iran stuck to the so-called agreement, if they weren't still creating nuclear weapons. The days of America leading from behind are over. The world will benefit from the wisdom of getting out of the deal and slapping a tough economic sanction on Iran. I'm Ron Edwards. Blowing away the myths and revealing the truth. You can continue to blow away the myths with Ron Edwards on the RonEdwards.com. Sponsored by the Tri-County Liberty Coalition. Ron Edwards, the new voice of America. Who likes paying taxes? Nobody. That's why Eva Rosenberg from TaxMe.com wants you to pay less of them. Read small business taxes made easy and learn how legally hiring your spouse and children can slash your taxes. Learn how to set up a business plan, minimizes taxes, the benefits of setting up an exit plan, how to avoid getting audited, and how to legally increase your deductible expenses with better record-keeping techniques. Don't let the IRS squeeze you out of every penny. Visit TaxMama.com. Click on Ask a Tax Question to get free answers to your tax and business questions. That's TaxMama.com. My name is David Barnett, and I've been helping people buy and sell small and medium-sized businesses since 2008. So far this year, I've gone on five vacations. It's because I've got my own business. When you get tired of being managed by someone else and you decide that business ownership is right for you without the risk of starting your own unproven enterprise, then come over to businessbuyeradvantage.com. There are over 100 YouTube videos on buying and selling businesses that you can watch for free. That's businessbuyeradvantage.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I am your business diva, Melanie Collette. Hello, Doug and Shelly and Mike and all you guys there in the chat. Giovanni, who else is there? Robin. Hi, welcome. Thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate it so much. My guest today is author Kevin Kellett. Ke Come on, Melanie. Kevin. <laughs> is, is Kevin. It's Kevin Cullis. Very complex name. I don't know why I'm having you know such a hard time saying it. I mean, really. Uh, <laughs> my guest today is Kevin Cullis. He is the author of How Would Jesus Do Business? Bible Secrets for Christian Startup Entrepreneurs. Very excited to talk to him today. Uh, the one and only Keith Little, who is just, you know, he has like a magic talent for connecting people. Seriously. Yes, he like yes, he, he, he's magical, right? Yes, so <laughs> needs to develop that talent. But anyway, uh, so please tell tell my audience a bit about yourself, about your, your background. Okay. Um, I was born at an early age. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, graduated from high school, went in the Air Force, enlisted in the Air Force, uh, and was a crew chief, which means I was, in, I was working on aircraft, uh, went from uh, Utah, England and then back to Utah, got out, got my degree in history, uh, graduated in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was in, was in presidency and he, of course he expanded the uh, military and I went back in as an officer and became an aircraft maintenance officer, uh, served in, um, in Clovis, New Mexico at Cannon Air Force Base on F-111Ds, went to Vicksburg, Germany on F-15Cs and Ds and then right before I was ready to leave, the Gulf War One started happening, and I went from uh, fighters to B-52s and KC-135s. And just before I got out, I got involved with at the time it was called TQM, stands for Total Quality Management. I uh, went to the wing to help train the military to see how can we be more productive with the resources we had. And then after I got out, got my master's degree, my thesis was on quality and process improvements. And then I, I needed uh, work, so I started selling computers, 
spent three uh, three years selling computers at a computer store, then went to work for Apple for three years, was their number one salesman in my little area, and then I got out. That's one of those things that, you know, when you're in a, a corporation, you say, I have a lot of talents and skills, what do I do? And I try to apply it to say, hey, I want to be promoted. Of course, you know, there's a glass ceiling even for older folks saying, uh, you have to reach these numbers, and they were they were worth in any you know reasonable perspective. So I said, okay, what do I do? So like squeezing on a balloon, I started saying, well, what can I do? And I said, well, let me start writing, you know, my my uh, my thoughts about computers. And long story short, uh, I produced my first book called How to Start a Business Mac Version. It's from an entrepreneur's perspective on how to use a Mac rather than a point and click and here's how to use iMovie and pages and whatever. It's saying, okay, what is the business case for it? How do I need, why would I need it? What's the business way of doing it? And then what software would help solve that problem? And then I produced that. And then uh, in October of 2013, you know, when the first part of the book, I talk about mindset, uh, being an entrepreneur. And I found that some set similarities between being an entrepreneur and uh, being in the military, uh, being in the military, you're mission oriented and being mission oriented or driven saying, hey, I got to complete the mission. Well, in business, you're customer oriented. So there's a, some similarities there. And so I rewrote the first section and boosted it up. And of course, one of the things I did was say, OK, in the military, who was some of the strongest entrepreneurial ideas and, and concepts and, and skill sets? And I said, well, Special forces because they deal with smaller, you know, platoons and, and groups and, and teams and stuff. So I did some research on SEALs and, and Delta operators. And in October of 2013, I was at a an event uh, where I met this gentleman. His name is Jimmy Graham, and we were talking about you know our elevator speech. And I said, Well, I'm an author here, and this is my book. And he's well, I'm a former Navy SEAL, and my jaw dropped. Because out of 325 million Americans, they graduate less than 200 per year as a Navy SEAL. So to come across one of them was like, this is like the 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 the, the creme de la creme. So we For become sure. good friends. Yeah, we become good friends. But what was interesting is when he's talking about his business and my business in in uh, November December of 2013. You know, what started out as a 30-minute conversation was two hours and discussing business. But then at the end of the time, I'm going, okay, we're both Christians. What does that mean, you know, with my faith and my business? So in the end of December and beginning of January, I said, well, I want to take a look at this, you know. And one of the questions I asked was, you know, I've been a Christian since I've been 14. I've never heard a sermon about faith and business. It's, and, it's so true. I was getting ready to ask you, like, what at, at what point did, did that c come in? Because you, uh, I mean, it seems to me uh, that a lot of, you know, part of what is going on in the world today is, is that, at least it, to me, politically and everywhere else, is that people seem to feel like they're separate, like they're completely oh, yeah. separate decisions. The, the, right. the decision, like, you go to church and you read your Bible, but then, like, once you go out and about, you kind of leave that stuff there. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. That was the whole point of going to church and reading the Bible. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. Exactly. It's almost as if, as if you put it on pause on Sunday night and then you bring it up on Sunday morning again, you know? Right. And, and, and so when I started asking the question, I started doing some research. I'm about five minutes from Denver Seminary. And so I went and looked at their libraries and, and, began doing some research and digging into it and I was appalled. I was actually appalled and and the, the premise of what was appalling was churches tend to elevate, oh you're going on a short term mission trip or you're going into the ministry. Well let's pray for you and let's bless you so your 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 ministry is blessed. Oh, you going to be a coffee barista or, or you're gonna be a a sanitation engineer. Well, well, we're not going to pray for that much. So it's this. Wait this, a minute. Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold yeah. on. What? Yeah. Wait, yeah. go back. Go back. I'm confused. It's, it's as if those in ministry got more, what should I say, clout 
than those who were in business or who had a job or a profile mom. And, ah. and it, so, so it, it's one of those things like, and, and, and guess what? It's not only in the Christian community, it's also in the Jewish community too. Uh, there's this disconnect between those that are in the clergy and those that are in business. And, and it just, it just floored me. And but the apostles, weren't the apostles basically businessmen? Uh, yes. And <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Okay, all right, go ahead. Here's the interesting thing. When I began doing some look at the literature, in other words, books, articles, all the other stuff, if you compare secular, the amount of secular content for business, think of it as content that's 100 feet tall. When you look at the business content for Christian business, it's like two inches tall. That's the disparity between the secular view of business and the Christian community of business. It's as if the Christian community has abdicated the role of, of business to the secular world rather than being the light in the, in the darkness. Well, so, you know, and, and I feel like there's a couple of schools of thought behind that, right? And actually, I feel like they're now that I'm, I'm thinking of like three, a, a couple more sinister than the other, right? Right, right. Oh, yeah. You absolutely. know, you know where I'm, you probably already know where I'm going with this. Oh, I know, I know. I you know, know, one is to keep the people in the dark, right? The more sinister one yep. is to keep the pe people in the dark and to think like that the only places that, that deserve the money is the church and to think that having money at all is like this materialistic really bad thing you know the money right. is the root of all okay. evil okay. so you know don't even don't don't teach um people to be blessed from a business perspective only only people who need to be blessed are the first are you know your, your pastor and the first lady of the church yep absolutely you absolutely. know there's that school of thought <laughs> yep. That's that, and that, and that absolutely is, is sinister. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And and that attitude, I I, I was when I finished up the first draft of it, um, I met with a friend of mine, invited me to two uh, business partners up in Boulder uh, that have been in enterprise level software development for fifteen years, and they showed me saying, well, you know, too often pastors don't realize that we're supposed to partner with the people in the church, when in reality, the ch the pastors think, oh, here's a blank, give me a blank check so I can pay for everything I want, when in reality is, you need to put some thought to what you're doing, not, we're not going to sign over blank checks, so absolutely, it's, it's a disconnect in pastors understanding business, economics, etc., so let me sort of give you the, the crux, and so we're talking money talk, this will probably shocked most who have not heard this. Let me ask you, Melanie, in the parable of talents, do you know what the talent was? No, not specifically. Okay. I and know that, about the parable of talents, but if you ask, like specifically what that was, I don't, I don't remember. Okay. And guess what? That's probably 99.99% of everybody to answer. So you're not alone in that. <laughs> you're, not okay. alone. you're not alone. You're, you're, you're in good company. Okay. <laughs> But I'm going to educate you and enlighten you here. I can't right. wait. Okay. Well, a little bit of background. When I grew up in my, in my 20s, I went to a church that we took three years to go through the book of Ephesians. I was going to say, but actually, before, before we get into this, can we, can we just background real quick and at least um, say what scripture we're referring to? Yeah, Matthew 25, 14 through 32, 31, whatever that is. Right. And, and now, it, it was a... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So the parable of talents is uh, it's a master pulling three uh, slaves in, and he hands five talents to one slave, two talents to one, and one talent to one. And he says, do business with this while I'm gone. And the, the word talent uh, is a Greek word that refers to, and the amount is, it is up to 200 pounds of gold or silver. Oh. That means... One slave got five pounds worth today at $1,300 an ounce, over $20 million, and he doubled it. And Jesus, i.e. the master, came back and said, You're, you please me. And so when I found out that amount, 
based on the word talent and what the literal number is. There's a there's a literal number. It was actual 200 pounds of gold or silver. And of course, the allegorical part of the the, the the story part is oh, refers to our talents, you know, singing talents, and acting talents. It refers to both, but the literal right. one is 200 pounds of gold or silver, and he got 20 million dollars. Kevin, shut the front door. <laughs> I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, when I, when I, just like you, shut the fuck up. I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, I, okay. I, I cannot believe I'm seeing this. And it's just like, it blew the shackles off my brain. And then just all of my brain started going, if Jesus talks about that amount of money in a business context, how come we're not? And right. then I said, we're always talking about the widow's mic, the two cheapest coins. Oh, we got to be cheap. We got to be poverty. But if Jesus talks about $20 million, how come we're not? Now, agreeably, you know, I think you and I would agree, it's not so much the money as what you do with the money after you've earned it. Right. You know, it, it's a matter of, are you earning it honestly? Are you earning it legally? Are you earning it so that you're not taking advantage of people? And then what you do with it after you get it. Do you hoard it or do you put it to work? And in fact, part of what I did writing the book was I literally took my Christian brain off set it aside and said, okay, since Jesus was Jewish, I need to get into the Jewish way of thinking and their mindset and their wisdom and see what it says. Well, in the Jewish form of thinking, the highest form of charity is hiring somebody, not giving them money. It's hiring them. In other words, putting them to work. Probably work, but also putting, giving them money, investing in them so they can start their own business. So okay. It just blew my mind when I heard that. That is mind blowing. I love it. That that that's mind blowing. <laughs> I, I I I'm I'm like I, I've never heard this before. I've never heard and, and you know any anybody who's I think anybody who's been to like a, a Bible study one hundred and one has heard the story about the talents like a thousand times. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. But they, but all you have to do is go to Blue Letter Bible. Right. Blue Letter, yeah. Yeah. Get I, the pipe. Type in talent, click on the word, the, the strong G5007, click on that, and the very bottom it says 200 pounds of gold or silver. Yeah, I have blue letter Bible bookmarks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read That's, so, a, that's, that's my go-to when I really don't understand something. I'm like, let me check out this blue letter Bible and see what's yeah. up. But, <laughs> so so that started me down this road of, okay, what does that mean? You know, okay, if this is the amount of money Jesus was talking about, what other things do I need to unearth? And it boiled down to is that, you know, Jesus, and here's from a, from a, a historical perspective, Jesus in, the, in uh, he was near the, the, the county seat called Sepphoris, which is about an hour walk from where he lived. When you look at the, there's a big book about a thousand pages called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. It talks about what it was like during his time frame. And basically, Jesus, here's the other key point of this, not only the money, but his life. He, from age 6 to age 12, went to Torah school or to school to learn about all the, the stuff that is to the Bible, you know, and then the Old Testament. Right. But then from 12 to 20, he was considered an apprentice in his career, i.e. a carpenter. Now, our version, our view of a carpenter is a woodworker, like I'm making you know, uh, bookshelves and, and chairs and tables. Well, in that area, wood was very expensive. And because it was so expensive, most of the time they didn't make lots of chairs and tables. So what were they doing? Well, he walked and there was lots of building going on, construction going up in Sepphoris. Right. He was, he was working with building buildings. He was putting in the roofs that were thatched roofs, that were wood and, and everything else. So in other words, he was talking about building houses and build business buildings, not just chairs and tables. So when you think of him creating stuff, it wasn't just small stuff. He was actually involved with big stuff. And in fact, in Luke, uh, one of the parables, he says, don't you first, before you begin building a large tower, don't you first calculate the cost? And I went, okay. here's a project. Here's project management, right, right here. So, and so, it just, so that just transpired. So from 12 to 20, he apprenticed. And from 20 to 30, or well, roughly from 12 to 30, 
for about 18 years, he apprenticed and successfully, without sin, ran a general contracting business. Okay, you're killing me right now. Like, you're going to like, <laughs> because you, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, you know, you, I've never heard anyone say that. Like, I, I actually had said, now, this is pre-ministry, right? This is right, pre, right. before this he started his full-time yeah, his ministry. ministry. Yeah, his ministry was from 30 to 33, okay? Right. We all talk about that. We all talk about that all day long, every day in church, whatever. How many times have we heard anything from 12 to 20 at about his, his being in business? And here's the other thing. He, because he was successful, we only have two areas of learning about how Jesus ran business. Right. The Old Testament, the Old Testament which is the, the 630 commandments. But here's the other thing. In the New Testament, about, a, about of the 40 parables he spoke, 80% are business topics. Stop. So we're talking land ownership, labor relations, uh, you name it. There are 80% of them are business topics. And I went, oh, I didn't even hear that either. So it's just like, it, it just, it blew my mind when I started doing this research that nobody talked about this. Now, let me ask you something. This, this is what comes to mind. Do you think that part of the reason he was doing that as an apprenticeship was in preparation for his full-time ministry? Like, do you think... That he, I mean, obviously, we know God, God provided, right? Yep. Yep. While he and the apostles were on their ministry. But they also clearly, uh, you know, did some work when they were doing the fishing and all that yep. stuff, yep. right? Yep. And, and then, of course, after Jesus passed, you know, they continued to do their work as, as they were doing their ministry. At least I got the impression that, that they were, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. He, well, think about it, that he... He was out, and, and what's interesting in Sepphoris, uh, when you look at Sepphoris up in Galilee versus Jerusalem, Sepphoris was a really a cosmopolitan, it would be like New York City with all sorts of people coming in from Greeks and Romans to Turks to you. I mean, he was seeing and interacting with everybody in the world. Whereas as you get closer and closer to Jerusalem, you become more and more highly Jewish. So <laughs> Right, I hear yeah, what you're so, saying. Right. Yeah. So, so when you look at that and look at the the economy of, of Sepphoris and, and Galilee, it was multicultural and multifaceted, and and so you know you when you see that economics perspective, the economic development of that, and you look at Jerusalem, it, it, that's also you know when you look at it going the corruption that was in the Jewish leadership. No wonder he wasn't a part of the Levites and the pastors and the and the and the priests and whatever. He was disassociated, which means it would be like Jesus coming out to uh, um, rural Colorado Springs, and I'm going to Washington D.C. That's the perspective. Because when you're rural, you're self-reliant. You're trying to take care of everybody, as you know, together. So it's more of a community versus Jerusalem with a power structure. Right. So, you, you know, you, I mean, there's so many things I have. I'm still learning as it goes through. That's that is incredible. I know, and 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 to think that the church kind of avoids this whole thing. It also provides them, and this is also kind of uh, you know from a sinister perspective. I'm thinking it provides them cover for some of their own practices. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and that's why I say. You know, when you look at Jesus, he spent 18 years in business and then three years in ministry. Right. How many, past, how many pastors do you know have been in business? I know very few. Mm. Very few. Yeah. And, and here, and here, here's the part that Jimmy and I were talking about. The question came to mind. I said, Jimmy, if we're having difficulty with our business, how come we're not going to see our pastor? <laughs> how come we're not talking to our pastor of the issues that we're having in our business? Why? Because most pastors don't have a clue. Well, and I, and and that's the thing. I mean, you if you go, if you go to your average business consultant, some of what they're going to be telling you is how to beat the system. Correct. And some of Correct. it's going to be some of it's going to be probably probably not illegal, but probably unethical. Correct. Hundred percent. You know, and, and that's and and therein lies where the Christian is going to run into the problem. Amen. Okay. And, and what's really, and what's really interesting, 
we're up against the break. I don't mean to cut you off, but we're up against the break. So we'll talk some more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. That's who I am. I'm your business. <laughs> I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. My guest today is author Kevin Cullis. He's talking to us today about how would Jesus do business? Bible secrets for the Christian startup entrepreneur. I am so appreciative that he's on the show today. Just very insightful information. We will be back in a few moments. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Hey, it's Sean from the Sackheads Radio Show. Also one of the owners here at the SHR Media Network. Are you opinionated? Have you ever wanted to do your own show? Have you ever heard somebody like the Sackheads and go, yeah, I could probably do that better? Well, now's your chance. Send me a five-minute clip at sackheadsradio at gmail.com. Maybe you can be part of the SHR broadcast. Backheads Radio at gmail.com. Broadcasting behind enemy lines in occupied California. A mean on the state capital. The Global Yating Zeppelin's Reserve Broadcast Blue and Radio Show can be heard every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 p.m. Pacific and 11 p.m. Eastern. Only on the SHR Media Network. Go to SHR media.com to listen you can also watch on the shr media facebook page and the shr media youtube channel making up the status when dirty politicians shadow government accept islam and the world with extreme media smoke their only fear is one man retain i'm dave milner join me through shrmedia.com i plains talk radio.com on the west Free Radio Network at Spreaker, YouTube, and iTunes for a different perspective weekly on the Unpleasant Blind Guy. And catch me on Jeff Mitchell's EDL Radio on blogtalkradio.com. There's no surrender ever. Because truth is not always pleasant. Hey guys, it's Sackhead Glenn. I'm excited to tell you a brand new show here on the SHR Media Network. I'm teaming up with the one and only all-powerful, bloviating stuff right, sitting right. here on my left, bringing to you a, a fresh new show. Uh, here on the network, it's uh, against tyranny, and uh, we'll be picking up where the sackheads left off. Excited to be with you, sir. Sackheads against sackheads against tyranny. We're gonna chat. We're gonna chat Wednesday night. Sackheads against tyranny. Wednesday night, 11 p.m. Oh, it's the same time, right? 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Same sack time, same sack channel. SHRmedia.com. See what I did there? It's your business, David. Here, Bill. I am inviting you to front as I discuss some of the most intriguing details of wealth and finance from today's movers and shakers in the world of business. Listen in and discover financial truths on a global, domestic, and household scale. Uncover topics that will impact your wallet today and in the future. Money Talk with Melanie airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West, right here on SHR Media at High Place Pundit Talk Radio. You can't afford to miss it. Christian by base, American by nationality, and conservative by choice. Between Ralph J. Chip Sr. is the right guy on SHR Media from 8.05 to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. And if on the rare occasion I am ever wrong, I will still always be right. The right guy on SHR Media. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, and our guest today is Mr. Kevin Callis. Mr. <laughs> the struggle is all, all excuses, so it doesn't matter me. Oh my goodness, the struggle is all the way real today. My guest, my guest today is Kevin Cullis, author of. The book, What What How Would Jesus Do Business? Bible Secrets for the Christian Startup Entrepreneurs. That's that's what it is. That's his name, and that's the name of the book. Yeah, I got it. I'm a professional. <laughs> professional talker is what I yeah. what I am. Yes. <laughs> anyway, anyway, welcome back. We're having a great conversation with him today. So very excited. Uh, to have you on the show today. Great conversation. By the way, I don't know if you are still in the facey chat, Kevin, but
but uh, fa <laughs> but fantastic uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Mike Fitzpatrick, and I actually have two Mike Fitzpatricks in the chat. I actually have three just uh, fun facts about about uh, about Melanie uh, today. I have three friends named Mike Fitzpatrick, and I think three named John Campbell. And there are two Mike Fitzpatricks in the Basie chat right now. <laughs> but both uh, think I have a fantastic uh, chat today, uh, a fantastic guest today. Just, just, just saying. That's good. Yes. So that's so that's a good thing. My, 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 both Mike Fitzpatricks said, great guest, great topic. So, and Doug says I'm doing ex exceedingly well. And But Doug, you know, he's got rose colored glasses, that guy. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I want to give I want to give a shout out to Doug. I, I posted it somewhere, but I want to actually want to say it on the show and get it recorded. That last week, while I um, was basically pretty much crying every day when I came home, uh, <laughs> instead of doing my show, Doug was um, Doug Poss was kind enough. He he was he, I did not ask him to do this, and I noticed my show was being shared. Uh, every day he shared a show, which is typically what I do uh, if I'm not going to be on the air. I'll do a re-air or something like that. And Doug was sharing at least one of my shows every single day. Now, that is a faithful listener right there. Um, that is just I, love beyond love. And I, I cannot thank you enough. It's just, just kindness beyond kindness and i just really want to thank you for that doug i know i already said thank you but i want to thank you on the air so that my shr media uh listeners can hear that and my high flames pundit talk radio listeners can hear that and my itunes listeners can hear that i want everybody to know what an awesome guy you are just saying uh and that you did that and that if you guys heard any replays that it was all because doug was kind enough to share them for me and i appreciate it all right anyway <laughs> Back to the conversation at hand. So we're talking about uh, Jesus having been an entrepreneur, like big time entrepreneur and apprentice Amen. before he went into his full time ministry. Yes. Yes. He, he spent from age 12 to age 30. Uh, he apprenticed from 12 to 20 and successfully ran from 20 to 30 or about 18 years. He was an entrepreneur. Uh, and we don't talk about at all that time period uh, and, and what he went through and why he went through and all the stuff related. And, and you know, when you stop and think about it, he was picking up rock. He was involved with masonry and, 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 and big logs and stuff. So guess what? His hands were not sissified. You know, it was rough. <laughs> you, know, you know, it was. He didn't have to worry about you know getting. Uh, oil, olive oil on it, you know, to, to soften it up, you know, because he was six days a week, he was literally getting his hands dirty, you know, uh, like a construction worker. So right. He had, he had muscles, you know, not Arnold Schwarzenegger muscles, but, you know, he still had muscles to, you know, carry logs and, and rocks and, and everything else. So he, he was he was a strong man, strong dude. Yeah, somebody said that in the Facey chat. Somebody was like, yeah, Jesus was no whip. He was a, you know, a strong guy. For sure. Yeah, now, so t tell us about some of these secrets for the Christian entrepreneur. Talk to us about that. Okay. Uh, remember, I mentioned earlier that uh, the church I grew up in, we took three years to go through the book of Ephesians. So word for word is what we went through. Wow. So when I started going through like the parable of talent, when I found out the talent was the large money, I began, you know, I took my Christian head off and tried to get in the Jewish side of things. And part of it, I said, well, what did Jesus, how did Jesus run his business? Well, when I talk about the Ten Commandments, I said, well, let me start there. And let me see what that says. Well, you know, going through it, okay, yeah, love God, you know, love your neighbor, you know, don't steal. Well, I went through word for word, which every one of them, and I got to the Tenth Commandment, where it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, la, 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 la. And I went, okay, so again, I stopped, I slowed down, I didn't gloss over it. I said, word for word, what does it say? And it says, thou shalt not covet, which means a strong desire, and covet means I want what is yours, not, oh, Melanie has a Mac, I want a Mac too, but no, I want to take Mac or her Mac, you know, I want hers. So it says, thou shalt not covet, la, 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 
anything of your neighbors. And I had to pause at that. And I went, wait a minute. Where did this word anything come up? And that really started the snaps going. And I'm going, wait a minute. And of course, being an entrepreneur and, and, and being an author, I'm always being asked to go out to have coffee and always being asked, hey, Kevin, can I take you out the coffee to what? Pick your brain? And so it Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. My experience is my blessing and my intellectual property. And so it's like, if you're picking my brain, you want my experience, and you're not willing to pay for it. So it really started me thinking, and as well as convicting me, that when I talk to Melanie and I start asking her questions about money, the first thing in my mind is, how do I pay Melanie for her experience? Unless she tells me on their, her own goodwill and, and with charity or whatever, she decides to give me that information. Or but unless you, you say up front that that's what you're doing. Like, listen, would you mind, do you, yeah. like, do you mind yeah. giving me some advice? Yeah, well, understand. Primarily, the idea is, is we think of it as, it's, in fact, most of the Christians I talk to, it's almost like, hey, can I pick your brain? Oh, yeah, let's talk. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when there's something specific, like, I want your experience, and I'm not going to do anything for it, that becomes more of you're taking from me. Because the word anything means what? Anything. 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 And, and so it literally started convicting me on how I interact with Melanie or Keith or my friend Jimmy or my wife even. How do I interact with them? Do I expect something for nothing? Do I expect, am I entitled to what they have? And I agree, but there's, you know, there's a difference between brainstorming, coming up with solutions. But when I look to somebody who is an experience of, has experience that I am looking for, the question becomes is, do I take without bartering? Do I take without giving? And there's a, a, a serial entrepreneur out in uh, California named by the name of Steve Blank, who he said, I got tired of, he's a serial entrepreneur. I think he's like on his fifth or sixth company. And he said, I got tired of people saying, hey, let's go out to lunch. I need to pick your brain or take you out the coffee. He said, now he said, what I do is when they come out and say, I'm going to pick your brain. He said, no. He said, if you get 30 minutes with me, giving me giving experience and give you uh, you know valuable advice i'm going to been spend 30 minutes of getting the same value advice from you ah that, there you that, go that is the thing that should be we should be bartering back and forth that if i share something with you share something of equal value that i perceive as equal value to me Make sense? <laughs> exactly. Mike Fitzpatrick, Mike P. Fitzpatrick, since I have two in the basic chat, says the first the first consultation is free. Let me ask you something, and I'm and, and, and this is really kind of a, a, a personal uh, business issue that I'm having <laughs> from a Christian perspective, okay. right? So I do consulting work, but I, you know, for, for some political consulting work, right. Right. and. Uh, the people because I've worked with these people so long, they tend to want me to start working before they've actually paid me. Right. And and because I am squishy when it comes to people that I love, <laughs> right. 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 I you, you know what I mean. Like yeah. I tend yeah. to do it, and we're and we all are like you know Christian conservatives. Right. We're all right. Christians. Right. And well, I'm just kind of like. Er, but it's all on me, right? I should just be yeah, more. It's all on you. It, well, it's on both of you. And and here's here's where here's where I in doing the study and research and just trying to digest all this. What does it, what's the second commandment that God says that we're supposed to do? Love your neighbor. What? Yeah. As, as yourself. yourself. Sure. Not and here's here and I asked a, a, a friend of mine. Uh, Patricia Raybon, who's a, a black author, I asked her, and she, you know, teaches communication at the university level. I said, okay, what's in that phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, what's the most important word? And she knew it 100%. She says, as. 
I said, exactly. Oh. Because when you love your neighbor as yourself, that means I look at Melanie as an equal, that she is just as good as I am. And here's the, here's the three terms I use. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. You're not supposed to love your neighbor for yourself. What can I get from them? Nor are you just supposed to say, I love my neighbor instead of myself. Oh, my gosh. You just hit the net. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. So when, you, when you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not loving. When, you, when most people act, hey, kind of pick your brain, they're loving you for what you can do for them. You're right. Because, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they, we're getting started on this whole thing that we're doing. And I, I got a text message about getting something done. I want to say, where am I check at? No. <laughs> like, where's my check? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't, I didn't say that. I'm so, just... so, you know, when you hear that, it, it, when, when, when you look at love your neighbor as yourself, it looks as an equal. An equal means not that a neurosurgeon is supposed to get the same pay as a plumber. No. It's, you look at it as that, that, that the market rate goes. And when you say love your neighbor for yourself, that means I win, you lose. Or it's, I, love you, I love my neighbor instead of myself, which I think some women have that. I love my man more than I love myself. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well. Okay. It, 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 or, or, you know, a husband says, well, I love myself more than I love my wife. No. So that's why I use the word as for and instead of and to trying to show the dynamics of saying you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, not for I'm superior and I win, you lose, or an inferior instead of I love my neighbor instead of myself. That I, I have never heard that 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 scripture broken down so eloquently and so thoroughly. I've never thought of the other side of that. At, 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 at all that is amazing okay we only have a couple of minutes left uh in the show and, I'm, <laughs> and i want to make sure some people are laughing at, at what i said earlier about when i got the text and i was like where's my check but i didn't i didn't say it which i should have but <laughs> but um how can people get the book how can they get in contact with you that kind of thing G give us all the deets before you go okay uh, the best thing to do is contact me on LinkedIn, and my name is Kevin Cullis, C-U-L-L-I-S, and connect with me on LinkedIn because I want to know who I'm speaking to, uh, and that way we can start on a professional perspective. Uh, you can also go uh, uh, search on Google saying, how would Jesus do business? My name will come up in two places. It'll be HWJDB. It's my blog site, which has my book, and, and my I'm actually starting a but I have a call my fish tank startup workshop next month. It's a, a Friday night and all day Saturday on anybody who wants to start a business here in Denver. So I'm starting it and moving it and I'll probably go nationwide at some point. And so how do you do business or startups from any street, which is sort of a secular perspective, but showing, hey, even communities they, uh, make money uh, in the community. So those are the two places. LinkedIn, how would you do business and startups on Main Street? Excellent. Perfect timing and six o'clock on the news. So I want to take this last minute to thank everyone for listening. You guys in the facey chat, everybody out there in SHR Media and High Plains Funded Talk Radio Land. If you are listening to this as a download on iTunes or any of those other mediums, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. You guys totally rock. His name is spelled Kevin Cullis, C-U-L-L-I-S. Ms. Kim Sharp, thank you so much for having me. Remember, all of this is very important because after all, it's your money. Have a good night.